There we go. Now, as I'd mentioned, uh, I'm autistic myself. And so my experience is very typical for people that are of our particular neurotype in that um, employment tends to be underemployment. There tend to be gaps between length of employment. There are difficulties with um, progressing within a job in understanding a neurotypical culture, company culture, and the rest of it. And this leads to situations where we can do what's called masking, uh, where we try to act according to the script that we see in the typical neurotypical population. Um, so it's always a process of, from that perspective, having a disability and trying to integrate and navigate and succeed in a world where there are a lot of unspoken rules in terms of how to behave, what to say, um, the things that are particularly difficult, like nonverbal communication. So what that ends up resulting in is a very low uh, employment rate for autistic individuals. It varies according to whether you're talking about North America or Europe uh, or the USA, but the average is around only 34% of uh, autistic people have long-term consistent employment. And of that, only 6% is what we call competitive employment or employment that pays very well. Uh, as a result of the stress from income situations, food insecurity, the stress of masking uh, and other causes, our lifespans are shorter, uh, between 39 years to 54 years instead of 74 years in the mainstream. Now, on the other hand, uh, autistic people often have a lot of skill in terms of being able to focus deeply, uh, enthusiasm for their and knowledge of their particular area, uh, which can be sciences, uh, legal, creative, and what have you. Uh, so the purpose of my project, uh, and you can see here, this is just a series of articles I have on this whole issue. Our project is intending to create and train a model for support matching and for income matching for autistic individuals. Now, we all know that there's bias inherent in the system in terms of training the models. This shows up in terms of how resumes are filtered. Um, it can show up in terms of how certain populations are represented uh, at the expense of others or misrepresented. So what we feel we can do with this window that we have with deep funding and our current projects is to develop a matching model that will become a knowledge graph uh, that can be trained by us for us, trained on what autistic or neurodivergent, um, dyslexia, ADHD, and so on, uh, characteristics are. If we look at it from an employment perspective, uh, it's sometimes described that we have what's called a spiky profile, where we're really great at certain things, but less good at other things. Sometimes those can be interpersonal, sometimes they can be communication habits. But in terms of productivity and knowledge, we tend to be more productive than the neurotypical community. Uh, we tend to be quite honest, and this is surprising and peculiar, that brain scans have actually shown there's an area of the brain in autistic individuals where we struggle with questions of um, morality, where we tend to err on the side of morality, even if it costs us. And so, of course, within a working environment or more challenging environments, this can uh, lead to situations where we don't have the income or the opportunity we require. So what we'd like to do is create a model from the ground up. We'll base it on what the math is and the science is according to matching models that already exist. But I think that it's important for us to see what happens when we train a model that's based on our own requirements and needs. And along with that, there needs to be methods to uh, train such a model. So we'll skip ahead to this. What we're proposing for the empathic knowledge graphing is a very private and personal on-device secure diary style application where eventually through the online model, you'll be able to get uh, suggestions in terms of, well, I had a difficult day. I need to stand, but I'm not sure if that's okay. And for those of us who are new to neurodivergency or autism, stimming is motion or habits meant to soothe. The stereotypical stimming is shaking hands or doing other things, spinning around, and what have you. It's because the visual and auditory and other sensory overload is too much. And this is a way for us to recenter ourselves. You'll see me rotating on my chair. It's essentially the same thing. So when it comes to training our own custom model, which I think is a really exciting endeavor, because what will come out of this, what will emerge in terms of uh, a, a model in this case. So that means we go back to the application and we say, 
is it possible to create nonverbal inputs um, that with permission can be anonymized and sent to an online cloud model for training? That means we need to design, test, and explore, and this is exciting, a series of nonverbal input methods, um, tapping according to color intensity, motion, um, maybe using your voice to communicate a feeling. And then the question becomes, can that be translated uh, in a mathematical sense to a workable and viable um, knowledge graph model and matching model? Now, we can see in the diagram here, what we want to do is focus on iOS because it has the strongest uh, on-chip encryption that we can find and uh, biometric protection. This is where a person needs to feel Occasionally, I'll have to unplug Yeah, you can still hear me. Okay. So what we propose then is the ability to have an absolutely personal and secure diary protected with on-chip encryption on an iOS device. And then with the user's permission, they see an anonymized version of the data that will be sent to the cloud. The cloud model will be continuously trained based on these inputs. We'll start with um, a model that can be as neutral as possible, but then we'll investigate the question of whether we should build that from the ground up or adapt to something that's for use. I'm a little nervous about adapting for use because then are we just bringing uh, biases of the model along with the project? Ideally, I'd like to start from the beginning. Now, in terms of allies to produce this with us, we have uh, base blocks, the bottom row. They're experienced in creating uh, artificial intelligence models and in creating uh, applications as well. They actually gave us a solution for ASL recognition uh, before we decided on another vendor that was purely a, a cost uh, decision in their case. So most of the budget will go to them creating this model for us. So they have about 17 years of experience uh, with data science. So they're ready to go. They're giving us a good deal in terms of their time and budget because they believe this is something that can be used to help people that are um, at a disadvantage for employment and mortality. On the top row, of course, you see us, what we call Team Lowit. Lowit stands for the League of Extraordinary Talent. And you can see in the background here, I have a cartoon representative. The idea is that along with the technology we need to create, we have this branding idea to present ourselves as artistic talent differently than we have in the past. Typically, when we come to employers, uh, the presentation is that we have a disorder, we have a disability, we need special accommodations, but all of that tends to divert away from what we're really, really good at. The accommodations we require at work are simple things, usually like um, they need quiet or control of the lighting or work from home. Um, but the representation of autism in the workplace is still that of uh, a disorder. So the low it is meant to turn that perception around, present us uh, as having very strong, unique abilities, um, present us with a memorable style. And that will lead into one of the other projects, which is to create a generative version of ourselves that can be used on business cards and AR and what have you. So the purpose of the low it is to rewrite the rules of employment to create more opportunity for us. And that in combination with um, strong matching and uh, emotional support uh, algorithms through the knowledge graph, um, I hope will help to increase income potential and uh, gradually increase the lifespan that we enjoy. And I can go into more stats and details, which are pretty heavy subject matter in terms of mortality. But uh, we have an opportunity here at the Lowit with SingularityNet and with you to um, to produce this model and start to change that paradigm. And we're at a bit of a disadvantage because we don't have a lot of connections in the crypto community. So we're trying to figure out how to reach people that may be sympathetic to the project and uh, ask for their vote uh, in this uh, very finite voting window. So now I turn it over to you and ask you if you have questions. Thank Welcome, you. Um, Go ahead. No, mine was very basic. I just wanted to know we had, um, we had uh, this particular project is submitted under, and if you do know the particular number it is on the voting app. <laughs> yes, um, I'll check now. It's twenty six or twenty eight. I have it in the Discord channel. 
So we'll call that up for us. And let's see, so many tapping. <laughs> okay, so the low at empathic knowledge graphing is proposal 28 on the deep funding voting website. That's under the new funding pool, I guess, right? Yes, that'll be in the new projects uh, funding pool. New projects, okay, beautiful. And yeah, let's talk about, um, so what's the scope for this phase of the project? What's the scope? Yeah, is it going to stop? And um, if we are to extend this project, what's, what's going to be the future scope like of this particular project as well? This particular project, in terms of the future scope, we would want to incorporate more and more Singularity Net services. For example, the generative art aspect, which is another new project, project uh, will use the existing DALI uh, service on Singularity Net. Uh, in terms of the LOIT, we're on the non-technical side, continuing outreach, and we're receiving a really good response from business owners and leaders in the community because everyone knows someone that's autistic or ADHD or volunteers on other boards that are supportive of this. So for Singularity Net, if we're granted this, uh, it's a great question that I need to cast forward and we would begin to develop the empathy and then cognitive knowledge graph side of things. So this first project will be about creating the model that its primary purpose is to match income and to match uh, emotional support services. If we're fortunate enough to be granted another round in round four, then we'll begin to move this more and more towards a cognitive and empathic knowledge graph uh, so that we can have some safe and bona fide advice on the device itself. Uh, because often with autism, sometimes we need to practice the soft skills or we want to deal with a particular question in private. Uh, in the support groups I uh, participate in, we're less shy about communicating what's uh, troubling us. Um, but when we're navigating in a neurotypical world, uh, most often we have to mask or be very careful about what we say because we come across as unusual uh, too easily. So we'll begin to gradually make more and more of an intelligent model to help do the matching, provide emotional support, and provide feedback in chat. Um, in this diagram, you can see one section here in the middle has uh, a generated uh, suggestion. Tap the screen with your pulse to get a sense of what your emotional state is for the AI. Um, here's an option for slow breathing or try stimming for 20 seconds, something to bounce off of. And, um, modulate one's uh, uh, response to a situation with. In my case, uh, I can think of an example. I was called in to speak with the boss uh, at a previous job. And the, I, the subject, I think, was just to see what I was doing in terms of an early version of uh, avatars, communicating with avatars. But because every previous job that had always led to being laid off, um, it kind of amped up my, my emotional state. So I wanted to try and resolve what was happening at the business at that time, uh, in terms of uh, sometimes businesses cultivate a, a bit of a rivalry. The boss didn't want to do it. So with something like this, before the meeting, if I'd be able to tap and say, I'm really nervous right now, I could receive feedback saying, take a breath. It's probably okay. Stim for a few minutes in private and then go into the job, expecting the best. These kinds of situations, I think, will help a great deal. So to answer your question, Ubio, uh, more directly, uh, the first one will be creating the model and figuring out the inputs that are most useful for our neurotypes. And in a subsequent round, we can begin to develop the cognitive abilities uh, of the knowledge graph in line with where Singularity Net is going. I think it's a really powerful project. Um... Yeah, and uh, something which I know from personal experience though, with the right support. Um, I have a very close family member who um, was not supported in the right way growing up or in a neurodivergent way. And basically, people thought he wouldn't make anything of his life. But with the right support, he exceeded everyone's uh, expectations. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really wondering for people who see how much impact that this 
uh, could have. How how can any normal person get involved, whether that be uh, neurotypical, neurodivergent? How can people support the project? Thank you for uh, asking that. Uh, we have a website currently where we're in a phase of trying to build up our membership. It's uh, theloet.com. And we're also uh, in our Discord channels, which are currently private. We're setting up what's called Friends of the Loet. So if you're someone who is in the neurotypical uh, community and you know someone who's autistic or ADHD, or you're a business owner who wants to learn more, or you're a medical professional who may have expertise in neurotypes, then contact, contact us directly uh, through the website or through LinkedIn. And we can begin to talk about a partnership and an alliance in that sense. And we found that people respond to it really well because everyone wants to help. It's a question of understanding and knowledge, and as you say, supports. Just a quick question. So, mm -hmm. um, when you say income matching, what what mm -hmm. does it mean? What does it involve? What I'm talking about there is employment matching and means to gain income. Now, typically, uh, myself included, in between the stretches where we have consistent employment, uh, some of us get by by doing contract work. So income support uh, can be one of three things. It can be employment opportunities with businesses that are al allied with us as a friend of the Lowit. Um, it can be contractual opportunities, which may involve work from home. And it can also be um, government-based income supports. Um, to the government, it's possible, at least in Canada, and I think perhaps in North America, uh, that autism can be presented as a disability for income support in that case, which helps to um, remove some of the stress of uh, paying for rent and paying for food. But on the other hand, it's very difficult to obtain that kind of support, particularly as adults. In my case, uh, I was diagnosed very early because I was living on uh, military family housing which had a very great, a very good pediatrician. Uh, but that being said, there were no supports then. And as an adult, it's very difficult to, to reach that bar. So we're going to focus on uh, rewarding employment, uh, em employment opportunities, contractual, and also income support that is government-based in that order of priority. I see, I see. So like on the app, like you are connecting with these uh, opportunities, is that? Is that the point? Uh, that's correct. The purpose of the cloud-based um, machine model, machine learning model, would be to take our profiles, which can be quite emphasized in some areas and de-emphasized in others, and match those with employment opportunities. Uh, they may need someone who is very specifically an expert at data science, but needs to work from home, or another person who enjoys the social aspect of work, but needs uh, a place where they can work in private. Uh, these kinds of details we need to build up in terms of a data set and a machine model, uh, which we can only do through Singularity Net. So I'm hoping that we, we find our support uh, to do that. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Baseblocks, of course, will be the experts leading that, and they'll also push back against us. Uh, they're very good at saying, what are the essential questions? I'm very good at defining what direction we should head in and trying to focus the work. So between us, with their expertise and, and my experience, we'll be able to uh, bring this into being uh, within the budget, which I'm very pleased about. Let's see. Uh, any questions about uh, the load? I have, I have a hand up. I have a question, Kenneth. Um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe I should start with some context to my question. I, I myself am autistic and my daughter is as well. Um, and I, I'm very excited to see, you know, that this develop. There's a lot of tools that I'm seeing here that can help um, uh, neurodivergent individuals experience the world around them a little bit better, a bit more inclusive. And it, there's a lot of, of value I see here. Um, however, I'm just curious, is, is Loit mindful of allegiance or patriotism in the sense that neurodivergent is separate from the rest of society that they are you know independent from say the rest of the society because i think a lot of these tools that you're developing 
benefit every human and it's not just the neuro like i think all humans would benefit from this this type of uh self-awareness and and processing emotional you know feelings uh and the world that that surrounds them so is there like do you see that being a concern at all of of i don't know if i'm using the right words but like patriotism and allegiance to one thing versus the others and that there's a comparison between those two societies? Mm, uh, that's a very valuable question. And I think it also, you're bringing up the question of culture. Uh, what is neurodiverse culture? What is autistic culture? And in that sense, uh, interestingly, one of the papers that I researched for this proposal was a comparison between a team that was neurotypical and a team that was neurodivergent. And they were uh, charged with the task to solve the same problems. I think they were primarily business problems. And it was found that both were essentially equal in terms of their ability to solve these problems. But when they went to a, a mixed group, uh, that's where the productivity dropped. So when you talk about allegiance or patriotism, or to use another word, um, the culture of autistic reality, uh, that is a real thing. Uh, we do have structural differences in our brains and in how we express ourselves. And most of the time, it's easier to discuss this and express this with other autistic individuals. So the LOAD itself is very fiercely uh, focused on uh, neurodivergency and autism and ADHD. Everyone involved is either autistic or uh, knows or has children who are on the spectrum as well. So we have direct experience with that. In terms of the matching model, um, I take it as a great compliment that you say that would be useful for other people who are perhaps in the neurotypical culture. But we're concerned about biases in the model. Um, there are already biases in terms of CV intake, in terms of on-the-job uh, company culture. So we really feel the need to explore training our own model from the ground up with uh, neurodivergent or autistic or ADHD inputs. And to do that accurately, we have to figure out mathematically valid ways of input that can also perhaps be nonverbal. So a good portion of this is exploring what works for us in the AI realm, but still produces a valid data set that can be used in the matching model. So the TLDR, TLDR is that we're building it from the ground up, um, specifically with uh, neurodivergency and autism and ADHD in mind. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. I completely agree with the culture aspects that there, there's a, it's, it's definitely unique enough, right? Mm -hmm. Like I struggle fitting in in many areas for that reason. So I totally understand. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, I'm glad that you're here, that you're both here, that you're all here uh, discussing this because um, the experience of being autistic is typically a very solitary one where we have a lot of combinations in terms of a lock. We're trying to figure out what the, the keys are or the combination is to operate within neurotypical society. But I think that our culture, our neurodivergent culture, has a really important role to play in terms of we're already present in the sciences and culture and technology, but to make more room for us to contribute uh, without the um, difficulties that come about just through that uh, contrast between our culture and neurotypical culture. And I think that it's important on the machine learning and data set side and AI side to begin to leave in that with our perspective. And over the long, long term, um, I'm hoping that our participation directly in creating these machine models will also help inform uh, an AGI or a general intelligence as to um, another aspect of our human diversity. Uh, so we have some long range ambitious goals. <laughs> we'll see where it goes in a hundred years. But for now, this is what we'd like to focus on. Um, and when you talk about the difficulty of fitting in, Curtis, uh, you're bringing me back even to grade two or grade three, where I'd see classmates uh, doing these very strange kind of, one person loved to, you know, kind of express what he is saying through his arms and his shoulders. So I tried doing the same thing immediately afterwards and it completely fell flat. <laughs> and that's a mystifying to us because it's like, well, we did the same thing. Why isn't it working? Uh, or in the job situation I talked about recently, where I asked a question about what appeared to be a rivalry that was being encouraged um, between younger members uh, and myself, to neurotypical members and myself. And the employer didn't want to speak about it. So I paused for a moment and said, well, maybe it's how I asked. So I asked again, 
with the same words, but with a different intonation. <laughs> and that didn't work. So I thought, okay, maybe I don't have the combination right. So I tried again. <laughs> and of course, that led to nowhere good. <laughs> so communication is something that um, we hope to uh, facilitate in our outreach as well as in the program. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> communication is, is my struggle. I, I mm -hmm. found, I think because of the experiences you're mentioning, I find I'm commonly misunderstood. And so I tend to over elaborate and and make things more complex in nature because I'm trying to be understood, but I don't I don't speak the way they expect and therefore, yeah, sorry, I'm doing it again. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm glad that you are because I see myself in what you're describing. Um, even within this presentation, the way my mind works, it can be, there's a surface that we try to present in terms of the project, but underneath that, there are all of these particles and ingredients that make it go. And how do we, filter that through our voice to be able to describe it. And if there's a situation where we feel we're not being understood, then my go-to also is, well, let's just describe in greater detail. <laughs> and I find if I submerge into that, it both one becomes difficult to speak clearly, just in terms of using words, and also difficult to ensure that the dynamic between speaker and listener uh, is suitably nourishing for everyone. So I understand what you're describing. Um, if I think about creating a loaf of bread, I see the bread on the outside, but I also see the separate ingredients, even down to the motes of flour, um, how they're mixing together and a visualization of how heat is affecting the rising of the dough, projecting forward in time, what the bread will look like or taste like. And all of this kind of happens in this kind of um, highly energetic sphere of detail and activity. So how to articulate that can be confusing uh, for everyone involved. So I, I relate to what you're saying, Curtis, very much. And thank you so much for describing it. <laughs> one of us, one of us. <laughs> so the load itself um, is taking on this kind of creative portrayal to try and articulate our differences in a very positive manner in a memorable manner. Uh, one of our members of the LOAT who's great at marketing is just eager to have a little badge that can bring into a business, sail in and put it on the, on the table and say, we're from the League of Extraordinary Talent. Uh, but for it to be valid, it also needs to have uh, a technological underpinning. So I'm hoping that uh, Singularity Net can become the home for us to figure out uh, what a neurodiverse AI uh, should look like and what nonverbal inputs would be successful in creating that. And over the long term, we can measure our success in terms of income, stability, and longevity. And in return, um, it's my hope that the uh, society and um, certainly within creative realms and the technology realms will benefit from our way of looking at the world. Because they're pretty cool. <laughs> So um, the other projects we have involve creating a ASL. Um, if, if there are no more questions about uh, the empathic knowledge graphing, I can proceed to this one. Okay. And there'll be pauses between it because I'm trying to keep track of everything here. Now with the round one project with Carbix, we created uh, an industrial metaverse that's based around their carbon capture technology. And the idea with that is that the instruction would be avatar-led. And where we wanted to improve that was to try and work on the non-verbal presentation of avatars in terms of body motion and expression. And towards the end of the project, we're now on the last milestone, which is uh, trying to recognize American Sign Language. Um, Chat GPT became popular. <laughs> So during our project where we just wanted to have natural language processing, we suddenly had access to this amazing AI where you can ask it almost anything with a pre-prompt and get something back. It's useful in return. So um, we've integrated, integrated that into that project and I can show it to you later if you want to, to see it. Now, what we discovered with the ASL motion capture is that it's, first of all, a very complex multimodal language where you can describe a few different concepts at once, 
It can have double meanings to certain things. New technologies need to be described and given kind of a shorthand uh, gesture to refer back to it. In terms of capturing the technology, capturing the motion itself, that's also complicated. And that uh, a lot of the motion takes place with facial expression close to the face and gestures in 3D space. If you're wearing a motion capture body rake that captures facial expression, it's attached. And that becomes an obstruction uh, to both seeing the expression and capturing the uh, ASL communication itself. So what we did was, um, let's see, what we did was uh, commission a lot of ASL video from uh, existing interpreters. Uh, and there are different types of interpreters. There are deaf interpreters. And then there are interpreters that are hearing that speak within the community. So for that project, we want to take our initial model forward. The ASL model in our round one project uh, is one of three main modules. The three main modules are adaptive learning, uh, speech to text, and then American Sign Language Recognition. Because we have a finite time devoted to each one of these, with ASL, we're focusing on numbers and letters and a very finite series of around 15 command phrases. And that in itself is very difficult to do because you need to capture the gestures from a webcam. You also have to deal with um, hands or objects in front of one another and turning of the wrist. And more or less, that kind of works fairly well. We've experimented with two sensors and an iPhone as a face sensor. Um, we haven't been able to uh, afford the, the bodysuit to do motion tracking within this module. But we do have now pose tracking and hand tracking that can capture uh, alphabet. So in this project for the phase tool, we'd want to expand the vocabulary, um, improve the model training itself. Now, to do that, in terms of the model training, we found this fantastic model, a uh, data set from Microsoft called MSASL. And this is 25,000 uh, data points on a series of sentences with a series of speakers that we're now using to train the model in our last round one proposal. For round two, we would continue building on this to expand the vocabulary of ASL. Now within this project, there's also a learn and earn uh, economy that we can use Ajax to help create um, in the virtual world uh, products from carbon capture. And then a person doing that would be sent a real world sample of that thing. Okay. Okay. So um, that was a very brief introduction, but uh, do you have any questions about how ASL is handled with machine learning in our project? Sure, another great tool. Thank you for that. My daughter is also mostly deaf and we're dealing with ASL as well. So thank you. <laughs> Your daughter sounds extraordinary. <laughs> uh, um, congratulations to you. Uh, I wish I were that, uh, that uh, unique uh, and that uh, supported. So the reason ASL became a part of our round one project was because the partner, Carbex, uh, Johan, his name is Quincy. I call him Quincy has a daughter or a niece as well that is also deaf. And that was his motivation for including this in the project. Unfortunately, we got picked up for funding. So I wonder how a person who's both autistic and uh, speaking through sign language, um, what their experience of the world would be, what supports would be required for them to have uh, a fulfilling uh, life in a neurotypical world. Um, which brings up another point. There's a lot of research for um, white males in terms of autism, but autism presents itself differently according to culture, uh, ethnicity, what are the norms in a particular culture? It's different worldwide. And we do have an article that, covered that covers this in our proposal if you want to go to the links at the end of it to explore more about that, that there's insufficient um, understanding of how a female autistic person presents themselves, how uh, a female black autistic person uh, presents themselves, um, because it's all somewhat different. So in creating this project, we're hoping to 
uh, contribute to the scholarly effort uh, involved in this as well. So for ASL, because it's so complex, people have been working on this program project or problem since 1983. Uh, it's an effort that's seen decades of work, but hasn't progressed as rapidly as, say, speech to text for the speaking and hearing population um, or other accessibility. Accessibility on the internet generally hasn't proceeded to pace. So we think that AI can help us in terms of recognizing gestures. But when you start talking about ASL gestures, there's also going to be dialect. Um, there's also going to be culture. An ASL speaker in Spain may have a different uh, accent. Uh, and in fact, uh, during this training process, uh, Daisy here is from Nigeria. And we had another fellow doing um, interpretation who's from the Midwestern states. So we find that his accent in terms of ASL tends to be kind of in arcs um, with a very kind of a smooth presentation of his speech and pauses in between. And Daisy's, on the other hand, is very different. It's very definite um, with more motion of the hands from left to right and forward. So I can see, even as a non-speaker, a different accent there. And our training process, especially with the MS ASL data set, is to increase the ability of the model to recognize uh, these dialects. And because it's so complicated a language, we're starting with very objective series of phrases um, that don't involve a lot of emotional content that can be delivered with kind of a front forward speaker, as you see here. And uh, by the end of this project for round one, we need to show the avatars themselves uh, speaking in that. So it's a little bit crazy to take it on, but because it's underserved and it's such a vital method of communication for 20% of the world's population, um, I think that SingularityNet is a good home for that because there's that experimental side, there's the cultural side, and then there's the data science side. I see the, the alignment from this pr project and the other uh, in the sense of trying to not be biased like in this sense of towards the different dialects and, you know, the system not, or the model not being biased towards specific dialects being diverse. And I, that would be nice to where the, the person it is engaging with or interacting with, it understands their dialect and can reflect that, you know, specific dialect back to them instead of a centralized or localized. Yeah, I love this. Exactly. And in terms of centralized and localized, I think that could basically just mean uh, white, white American male. <laughs> How do they sign and then follow from there? Um, but that's not what language is. Uh, and as I learned about ASL, it's not what ASL language is as well. So what I would love to see in the round two, if we're funded, would to be to build a mechanism where people can voluntarily uh, contribute to their accents and their dialects uh, to the model itself through webcam. And so we're focusing now on webcam recognition. But if people would like to train the model through their own inputs, um, then we can begin to add on to uh, the data set that's already been created by Microsoft in this case. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I left uh, working with Daisy. Daisy is in Nigeria. And um, she's very, very you know, upbeat, very um, definite in terms of how the tracking continues. Like I learned, for example, since we're dealing with multiple choice that's represented by the hands and doing a gesture similar to this says, choose A, B, C, or D. Um, but when we put it through video motion capture processing, that video, it can deal with the slow motion alphabet and numbers, but it can't quite keep up with the speed of motion uh, for something like this, which is that fast. You know? So we have opportunities there to even within our very limited uh, uh, set of command phrases uh, for adaptive learning to improve uh, ASL tracking through webcam. Yeah. It's, it's a delicious challenge. It's really, really tricky. Okay. Um, so in terms of our projects, um, we have a few of them here. The knowledge graphing we've covered ASL we've covered, and there's also the promotional online event for SingularityNet. Um, something I had been doing 
with a hundo and with a ruby room over the longer term is trying to bring an artist's salon uh, to the real to the 3d world and this was brought about because i have a photographic background and um, i've worked as a video engineer an audio engineer i've done a bit of performance even as well and uh, photography and a few years ago when metaverse was the big deal a lot of the online environments looked really boring and i thought to myself well if we think about it from a cinematographic point of view there's so much you can do with lighting so much you can do with mood so i created the ruby room to uh to facilitate that and this was version one of the room It has Ready Player Me support, of course, as well. My favorite scene. That gives me goosebumps when I see it. <laughs> So that's an introduction to where the Ruby Room began. And from there, we were really fortunate to be picked up by Hundo. With that school season, Grammarly is a student okay. essential you need to download. Of course, advertisements. Now, Hundo itself is dedicated towards improving the employment prospects of Gen Z. As I understand it, they're a UK-based business or UK-based uh, entity. And in the UK, the unemployment for neurotypical teenagers is really, really high. Something on the order, I don't want to misquote them, but I think it was on multiple tens of percentages. So what they're doing is building a new way for people to use the blockchain uh, to show the skills they've learned and to present their resume for youth, for Gen Z youth. And they liked the initial Ruby Room with its strange creatures, its floating sky whale, its different areas. So we worked with them to redress the Ruby Room for hundo and i built it or dressed it in such a way that you can stand anywhere in the space and see two to three other areas of interest like a chill out zone if you want to break from the music you can sit in these egg chairs and listen to uh, river sounds or lo-fi chill techno you can go to a climbing area and get a, an eagle's eye view you can go onto the stage and dance and there's also even a, a fireworks display so i'll just show this uh, very briefly So within this, you can see there's a settings mode, there's accessibility supports that we build into it. You can turn off the lasers and the brightness uh, in order to support perceptual sensitivities. You can switch to a grayscale mode to reduce the color saturation to very, very mild uh, tones of gray. The fonts can be switched to a dyslexic friendly font uh, as well. So where that went with the Ruby Cathedral is to try and increase the space to almost 10 times its, its current volume. Let's see, let's turn this off here. So the idea, um, the idea of the Ruby Room Cathedral, it's about 80% complete. We need to put in windows and we need to put in these special portals that I'll reveal as well. It's a different style of portal. And the idea is to follow this AI generated um, layout and it's been uh, it's already been modeled by alper who's a 3d modeler so the idea of doing a ruby room cathedral uh, for singularity net is that we'll pick an event in 2024 um, i'll go to people who are active on singularity net and in the deep funding rounds and say how would you like to present your project uh, like the hundo space will have kiosks and areas set aside and other people have suggested that we introduce games as well. 
So this will be an exploration to see on how amazing and interesting and cool a 3D space can be. Build upon some of the accessibility and then see how an event of this nature uh, works with the Singularity Net community. Now we've had a few of these already uh, in terms of online events. We had an event for Ukraine, uh, the first uh, Ruby Run Salon, which was about architecture and uh, ecology. And uh, for Singularity Net, uh, we'd be prepared with a more authoritative centralized server uh, to handle people that are participating. We'll have better security in place in terms of having a bubble zone around you, being able to manage people that uh, may want to cause trouble and have a greater space in terms of areas you can go to view art, uh, to chill out with friends, to learn more about Singularity Net and to take in a show. So basically our proposal for the Ruby Room Cathedral is what you've seen of multiplied 5x to 10x in terms of the space and in terms of the uh, ability to support uh, visitors. And it is an experiment. Uh, we'll see if people enjoy it and show up and participate. And we'll be able to advertise it as well. Okay. Now, um, the other project that's close to my heart is modeling water table changes in virtual world. Uh, this came about from a conversation in 2021 to 22 with an ecologist and a microbiologist. The microbiologist was involved in remediating uh, mine, mining areas, areas where the ecology had been stripped away in favor of mining a, a mineral of some sort. So he was charged by a client to not only remediate the site and restore the vegetation, but to try and attract endemic uh, life forms as well. And that led to a conversation with this ecologist who said, the more water there is in a location, uh, the more you can do in terms of um, the plant life it supports, the microbiome, insects, um, small prey animals, and then eventually apex predators in the space. So the purpose of this would be to take an existing space that I already have, um, this multiplayer meadow environment um, in what Unity calls HD or high definition uh, lighting and build into it uh, a kind of a, for this is in the ideation, ideation phase, to build in a static model where you can alter the water table and then see the results in terms of which plants and animals become present. And if you have a lot of water, like on a riverside zone, then you can have apex predators that'll come and um, feed themselves through the unestablished uh, uh, prey species uh, on the landscape. Now, this has value in terms of how you can describe ecological changes to people who are non-experts, um, to people both who may live on the land who are stakeholders, but also in terms of policymakers. Uh, back in 2006, I worked with the Geological Survey of Canada, uh, where they're trying to work on these community questions. And this was before iPhone, before um, multimedia, and before immersion as we know it. And it was an extremely satisfying project. So this proposal is an effort to ideate, based on my already existing uh, immersive environment, to bring this idea of um, water table changes to the landscape as a demo mode. Uh, if we're successful and we proceed to a subsequent funding round, there, in say round four, we'll work on a true machine learning model that can drive water chain table changes to landscape, but also the behavior of uh, predator prey and uh, microbiome species. Yeah. So this one's an ideation phase uh, project uh, to just show it can be done, to show what the effects of water table changes would be and then hopefully um, proceed to a more valuable uh, true model for a subsequent funding round. And I appreciate you staying with me throughout all of this. Um, as an autistic person, it's the oration can be a little bit challenging. Do you have any questions about uh, these projects? That's what I'm just curious to see where it goes mainly. Yeah, it's very interesting stuff. Thank you. Um, I'll fire it up here. I have a few of these projects that are built in Unity. Oops, and that's the wrong one there. So the other projects that we have involved with this proposal 
uh, is AI lip syncs for avatar speech. And I'll just cover that briefly. Uh, when doing the Carbix project for round one, we're using a, a version of live lip sync that I can show you later, where it's basically just taking the amplitude of a voice and trying to match it to likely phoneme shapes. And there are about eight different phonemes, phonemes being vowels, uh, like A, O, N, T, H, and S, and so on. So it's a little bit robotic. It's not quite realistic. If we author that lip sync animation in a dedicated package, like they do for movies, then it can look very realistic, combined with nonverbal facial expressions. But I think now, with the oncoming metaverse or the greater prevalence of um, interaction with avatars, we need to take a cue from the gaming environment and try and make that work in real time. So we'd like to ideate how we would build a model that could deliver naturalistic lip sync facial curves in near real time when supplied with a text uh, sentence or perhaps even an audio sentence. So I'll show you where we've gotten in terms of the existing third party lip sync. But um, this is a kind of tool that is successful for the ideation phase and a, a following phase could be applied to a lot of different things to avatars on the web, to gaming, to accessibility to a degree, if the lip sync can be lifelike enough, combining that with ASL would be remarkable. Okay, so this is the wetlands environment. And my apology for going back and forth, the autistic side of me wants to cover it all, but the narrative that I described to you that you're kind enough to watch needs to be uh, coherent. Now, this project I had built um, shortly after the pandemic started, when I was let go from my previous job, um, trying to resolve an issue there. Um, I decided to create 40 environments. And these 40 environments um, span the gamut from desert ecosystem, coral ecosystem, this meadowland forest, to even a uh, surface of Titan or at the edge of a singularity in terms of labs that students could participate in. So this one already exists with a fairly optimized um, vegetation on the landscape. And can be adapted to our ideation phase for water table. So I'll just exit that and then go to let's see. I'll only be able to show um, the initial scene of the Carbix metaverse because it's still in progress. They have some video that's available on their website. So I'll have to be a little bit careful in terms of what I show you here. This is the environment in which the ASL module is being completed, in which we already have adaptive learning and uh, speech to text, and also text to speech from the avatar's point of view. Welcome, Welcome to the, to the Carmex Metaverse. Metaverse. Please, Please select, select a world using your using alphanumeric, alphanumeric, alphanumeric keypad. keypad. One will One take, will you, take to you to the geothermal, geothermal installation, installation, installation set in a glacier-filled glacier glacier -filled caldera. Two will take you to the float glass now, installation. Of course, in my case, I've actually Three run will this bring twice. you to Anya's lobby <laughs> for quizzes and presentations. So four I'll will teleport you to the showroom for up close study. Yeah. There, my apology. No worries. It can be edited out um, if you mm -hmm. uh, write in instructions um, for sure. So I'll start that up again. Yeah. So with the Carbix Metaverse, uh, which is related to our round two ASL project, and the voting proposal for ASL is proposal 17. 
Um, Welcome the to the Carbix Metaverse. Proposal for a model. Please water select table a world changes. using your alphanumeric keypad. One will take you to the geothermal installation set in a glacier-filled caldera. Two will take you to the float glass so installation. So through the funding, we've been able to create Three will bring you to Anya's lobby for quizzes metaverse. and presentations. Four will teleport you to the showroom locations. for up-close study of the X2 bioreactor. A one -to -one Five will bring you to the cement plant with installation. With the avatar and a showroom. Please enjoy your and visit. And these are great ways to show the kind of complex uh, chemical processes that take place. So we'll just go to. Yeah. Uh, we we were just hearing the the introduction about the rooms till now, so I think we lost you a bit on the audio. If you'd like to repeat. Thanks. Oh, of course. Now this is the result of our round one project, where we were creating an industrial metaverse that can show the Carbix X2 carbon capture unit, but also create API endpoints on marketplace for anyone, anyone to use that support adaptive learning. Uh, currently using a SciTech or SciQA data set, um, speech to text, which we're using through Whisper, and now ASL recognition that we're building. We have hand pose recognition at the moment, and we're working on words and then sentences to build that out. We're on the last milestone of our round one project. So in this case, uh, through Singularity Net deep funding, we've been able to build three on-site locations. Uh, one is in a geothermal complex in Iceland, in a caldera. Another is a cement factory in the Alps somewhere. It could be Estonia, we're not sure yet. And um, a float glass facility, uh, which is based on a relocation in France. In addition to that, we have Meet Anya, which is a one-to-one -one, uh, quiz taking room uh, where the adaptive learning and scoring is showcased. And then an X2 showroom, where you can see the actual machine itself what it looks like inside and what it looks like in its container and learn more about it. So I'll take you to geothermal. Loading geothermal site. Now here we'll see an introduction from the little floating ball, which is named Cora. Hello, Give an orientation. I'm Cora, your friendly locator drone. In this info window, you can find points of interest and see what I see. To run, hold down the shift key and W key. If you want to choose an information window or stop your camera following the mouse, tap the V key to lock and unlock the camera. Let's go meet Anya. So then Cora leads you to Anya. Run up here. When you get close enough, it provides the option to tap T to speak a scripted dialogue. Or you can use uh, show chat, which is where we've integrated uh, chat to uh, GPT and voice to text. Okay. So we go. Welcome. Here you can view the installation of the X2 prototype in a geothermal facility. An emission point is retrofitted with a scrubber directing CO2 to the X2. Now you can see here we actually have three levels of animation driven by a behavior graph. Um, if you want to see this one to one, I can show you a video at another time about the behavior graph. What I'm using is three flags or an idle motion, uh, a speaking motion, or a waiting for your question behavior. In the behavior graph, it randomizes the motion loops. There's a motion loop for the body language overall. There's a motion loop for the face, which is a second layer of animation. If you look closely, you can see little micro expressions. And the third layer, of course, is for hands and arms. And that's tricky because we only have a very limited set of maybe 15 um, animation loops to do this with. Um, if we're successful with uh, round two funding, we'll be able to do more motion capture and build out uh, a customized uh, motion capture library, both for ASL and for the nonverbal body motion. Now, you can see in her dialogue 
this is all based on amplitude, so it's a little bit robotic. With the lip sync project, the other proposal, we'd want to try and make that a more naturalistic expression. Models like this can have anywhere between 38 to over 100 facial blend shapes. Those blend shapes are used around the mouth for lip sync and then combined. You may have a pucker or a smile or a jaw that moves forward, backwards, up and down. These are combined to create vowel sounds. Now, if you get into more elaborate facial motion capture, then you'll also see changes in the muscles around the eyes, uh, the cheeks, the chin, and so on. And all of those combine to create a convincing human style uh, animation. So where we'd like to go is from this robotic lip sync that's real time to using AI to produce a more humanistic lip sync uh, involving more of these facial face shapes. The thermal energy contained in the interior of the Earth is called geothermal energy. Volcanoes, geysers, and hot springs are visible evidence of a large amount of heat lying in Earth's interior. Yeah. And you can see there's a real separation between her mouth and her eyes um, in terms of the naturalness of it. So that's what we'd like to obtain with the AI lip sync project, um, is to build up a model that can give us animation curves for the entire face, a more human lip sync. To go back to the ASL proposal, if we're successful there, we'll build out the machine model for ASL recognition, but we'll also develop and capture more emotion, both for ASL and for the body. Um, any questions? It's great stuff. It's really nice to see an example of where you where you are so far. So it kind of adds reference to exactly what the different proposals are kind of uh, leading towards. Um, but it's really really comprehensive, dude. I'm I'm very impressed and uh, excited for the project. Um, yeah, man. It it just seems we're reading or listening to some proposals uh requires a jump but as you have put it with the with these proposals they seem like a natural logical step which is uh is great. yeah well i appreciate that very much i can wave my hands and describe this but it's better to see it and have the avatar wave its hands <laughs> <laughs> yeah but what we've been able to do in terms of the nonverbal expressions around the eyes and uh, using the high definition render pipeline in Unity, how light falls on the skin and the eyes, the refractivity and the hair is another step towards uh, engaging avatars. And it becomes tricky because if it's too realistic, then it has to be totally realistic. But in this space, it's still an avatar um, and there's some room to avoid the uncanny valley but it's still engaging enough that she seems approachable and friendly. And um, the mm -hmm. hard of hearing interpreter I worked with in real life at the nearby library um, also commented that uh, she liked seeing different representations of the avatars as well, uh, in terms of uh, a black avatar, in terms of uh, Icelandic. And she felt that Anya had some black features as well, which I was very pleased about. Um, I'm biased, so I don't see it myself. But I think it's in the lips and uh, in the nose primarily. And I just love that notion of representation uh, in the avatar world. And you yeah. can see she's doing little minor kind of smiles and looking around with her eyes and so on. And that's a combination of facial blend shapes producing uh, nonverbal expressions. Having trouble with his eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's so much to see in these areas that are so complex uh, technologically. And just like in real life, I grew up in Nova Scotia, I fell into the snow. <laughs> Can we see the camera view from third person? Yes. 
Uh, of course, another white guy. <laughs> but um, ideally, I'd like to be able to have your own avatar. But we haven't gotten to that point yet. I had to just put in an avatar. So I'll go back to first person. Okay, and uh, talk with uh, Emily, as I call her. Hello, my name is Emily, and I'm a transportation specialist in charge of programming routes for self-driving trucks. Self-driving vehicles are a new and exciting technology that are revolutionizing the transportation industry. These vehicles are equipped with advanced sensors and artificial intelligence that allow them to navigate roads, avoid obstacles, and make decisions on their own. Okay, so I'll end it there. Um, there's so much more I could show because this project has uh, six rooms. But um, I just wanted to say thank you for your time and participating in this overview of six different projects. And uh, Curtis, it's especially great to speak with you and to hear your experience and also your family's experience with autism. I hope that we talk again and uh, about Likewise. this kind of project. Likewise, this, this is exciting. I mean, I, I, if you had that type of technology, what you just showed at, say, a global convention of some sort, and there was a room for governance and the room for um collaboration and community and room for education and ac academia and all these different initiatives and you can explore the different concepts in those rooms and interact with ai very very knowledgeable ai you know models or agents in those mm -hmm. uh specialized fields it's so interesting right a room full of role-playing agents that are specialists in certain things and you talk to them and interact like it's exciting where where you guys are taking this so many different things can be done with it thank you very much i really appreciate that uh it began as a desire to make metaverse spaces more interesting and way back in 2018 i was experimenting with avatars on iphone with just um, text input and replying so now with where ai is going and where it will be in the next two years to be able to have a more knowledgeable free form discussion on a project with an avatar is really remarkable. Instead of having to script everything, uh, in this case even, we have a little pre-prompt um, for the ChatGPT style interaction, where we say, pretend that you're a salesperson on a geothermal facility in Iceland, and you're teaching about carbon capture. And then it'll pick up reasonably close enough uh, conversation on the generalities of that situation to work. Now, with GPT-4, uh, we're able to have more specific information. It can access the web or you can fine tune the training. But then the question also becomes for SingularityNet and deep funding, um, should we have our own service? Now, should we have our own open source, open source model that we can begin to iterate and elevate um, to provide that kind of discourse without being locked into chat GPT's uh, terms and conditions, which can change any time. So as you say, this is an area where a lot of development can happen and it can benefit people who want to get their projects put forward. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I've been playing with multi-agents and and I love the concept, exactly what you're saying, prompt frameworks and uh, role structures so that they they know how to engage and interact, right, with, with the users. Uh, but there's, uh, this is what we're building on our platform as well, is a bunch of different agents, essentially, that are playing those roles, depending on the context, depending on where the user is at, you know, during their experience. Um, and, and yeah, it provides a lot of context. Because as you've min you mentioned it before with, with autism, mm -hmm. um, I have to, anytime I engage with somebody or interact with somebody, I, I have to try to bring in all the context so that I can form a perspective and it's unique in, in every situation. I mean, not, not only when I'm talking to this person, um, I, I have to structure how I'm going to interact with that person, but yesterday versus tomorrow, uh, maybe different experiences too. So it's trying to bring all that into context 
uh, and I'm finding I'm doing a lot of that with AI agents too, is, is what is your background and what is your intent and your, your objective with this interaction? And it may be different in every circumstance. So it's very interesting. I love, I love what you're working on. I'm excited to see where, where low it goes. Well, likewise, and I'd like to learn more about uh, the projects you're involved in, in terms of these agents that um, perhaps within this project or another project, I can begin combining uh, the avatars we have with what you have in terms of the uh, artificial intelligence agents. I'd like to learn more about your projects as well. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. I'll, I need to get more organized uh, because we have a lot of initiatives just as, as you guys do, have a lot of initiatives and you guys have done a really good job at packaging it to where people can digest it. And that's, yeah. that's where I struggle. I struggle with that. So I do too, as well. And trying to describe this many projects in a breakout room is really difficult. Even just having slideshows or the interactives themselves available. And then the autistic imagery. Uh, as I speak to you, I try to visualize the recorders with books and which book do I pull to describe the context with from this interior world to the exterior world. And I think you described something similar in that. Uh, we have um, an affinity uh, for describing the entire supporting structure <laughs> of an idea uh, yeah. along with the idea itself. Yeah, and I, I find that that's not very welcomed in the neurotypical world, right? Yeah. Because it's it's cons time consuming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's exactly right. And and you mentioned it before as well. I, I struggle with understanding where they're coming from, what scope they're in or what their perspective is. And mm -hmm. so I speak as if, okay, I don't know. I'm not gonna be biased towards, you know, what where maybe you're coming from. I'm just gonna explain the entirety and then you can pick and choose what you know what relates to you what your value is in it but most people say hey 90 percent of that is garbage to me i only wanted to hear the 10 percent. i don't know what 10 percent you're looking to hear so i gave you the 100 percent. and yeah it's, it's a struggle because communication is a challenge it really is um for you is it like being able to see the entire landscape and knowing how vast it is and then trying to be a guide with someone else in the landscape of our ideas, of your ideas? Um, you know, I typically find that I'm not trying to uh, provide them perspective and I'm not trying to form a perspective for them. So I give, I, I try to convey the landscape mm -hmm. and then let them determine what they see, you know, let them visualize it internally however that looks to them um and, but i i think in doing so it, it's um it's more than most people you, you know there's a lot i think a lot of people want to be guided mm -hmm. and i tend not to do guiding i'm i'm hey this is what the landscape looks like here's maybe some risks here's maybe some opportunities you take that as you will you know and and my, I, I do find most people well, what do you think? Well, I don't know. That's for you. <laughs> That's for you to decide. This is it. I find that I still have, uh, and maybe this is common with autistic people because we're always trying to, to find our way in, so to speak. But I find that um, there's still a bit of a habit, both of a little bit of pleasing, trying to please people by figuring out what their communication needs are, but also removing oneself from the conversation. Hi. <laughs> But also removing myself from the conversation as if I shouldn't have a presence or responsibility there. Uh, and that seems to go hand in hand with sharing the structure, but not guiding. Um, but the reality is so we can guide. It's just knowing where to, to lead. And I think maybe we're unfamiliar with having that process because it's safer to be outside of it, you know? Yeah, yeah like I... I do participate in that that guiding type of communication mm -hmm. after I feel that I understand their 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 core values. You know, so when I get to know somebody, it, it's a lot easier for me to uh, make assumptions of where they're heading, where they're needing me to to guide the conversation, or mm -hmm. 
um, but in general public, it, it's, I, I just don't, hey, I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know, you know, you may have a systems design approach because that's mm -hmm. your background and I can definitely convey it in that way. Or you may be a decentralized open source type background and, and you're more, it's about the, the community and I can approach it that way as well. But I just don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't click with, I have no idea where you're coming from. So I'll just hit you at all angles <laughs> until, yeah, exactly. and, until I get to know you. Yeah. And what if it's a group of people? Like what if there are two or three or yeah. four or 20? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like each is a beacon of where they're coming from in terms of time and knowledge. And it's a lot to, to kind of um, concatenate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Supervisor council um, meeting earlier was you could see that there's a lot of different uh, perspectives and opinions and it seems like we're all there to discuss uh, how do we collaborate amongst each other in this diverse environment and even the people that are preaching um, diversity and open community are saying and that's what this looks like you, you know and, and it has to be sort of this way you know that's a struggle right you're you're it is yeah what is <laughs> truth what is reality <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah very interesting um yeah i'll send you my linkedin real quick as well yeah i saw yeah, your email the same. Um, it's a great pleasure talking with you um you I hope to well. learn more about uh, uh, what you're doing yeah, so our initiative is Decipher, and we're trying to build out community, uh, like a community platform type of thing that mm -hmm. supports governance frameworks, project management uh, structures, communication tools, um, aggregating community feedback and turning that into insight, self-reflect off of that insight as a community so that we can direct conversations and then turn hopefully that into decision making uh through a, a decentralized practices and it's just mm. putting together a bunch of modules that we see forms and makes up a community mm. um and, and now with, with a, a series of say templates you could oh hey let's choose a sociocracy style uh, a governance framework or a holacracy wow. or a, a whatever and you can pick and choose from the templates build out your community and and the intent there is the community and the culture can sort of form itself mm -hmm. over time it can iterate over time mm -hmm. and it supports that community voice to where if they want to change the way the system uh, is designed you can but you, you do sort of need to start somewhere that's my finding is is you can't create this huge organization and culture without common grounds, without understanding your, the, the nature of that community. Uh, so we're just trying to build structures and frameworks so they can stand up, you know, one day just say, hey, I got this great idea. Well, then let's use this platform and deploy it using these metrics, build out our community and then have the community sort of self-run itself sustain uh even its own governance um, mm -hmm. um if i were to articulate that back it sounds like you created templates and an armature or a structure for a group of people to get going in terms of uh, the governments they can select from a style and build upon it but then over time it becomes their own as they shape it it's a way to uh, support the initiation of that process out of the confusion yeah, yeah. Um, it's we're hoping to do it twofold. So provide them the tools to where they can do this immediately if they choose to, uh, but also have a bunch of onboarding material introducing them into what does holacracy look like, what does um, plutocracy look like, sociocracy. What are the different themes, mm -hmm. you know, and insights? But it's not just governance. It's also we, we have tokenomics models, business mm -hmm. models. And you can pick and choose from those and and i find a lot like we had to we had to discover all of that those concepts and all the different options out there what's good and what's bad about all of them none of them are perfect 
right? At the end of the day, there is no perfect system. So you have to pick and choose which one aligns with your values, your mission objectives, and how do you plan to get there? Do you want to do it with 15 people or 15,000 people, you know, making these decisions? That's mm -hmm. totally up to you and your initiative. Um, but at, if we can onboard people with this education and information of what this looks like and what it, uh, why it's valuable to you, you decide, but, um, at the end of the day, that's what you're learning from this experience. And then you're also getting access to the tools that could get you there in a, I think a much quicker, uh, manner. Yeah. Getting you sustainable in a much quicker manner. That's fascinating. I'll have to, to read more about it and see it in action, but it sounds like you've gone through and almost evaluated the history of human governance uh, in these different styles. Yeah. You know, inadvertently <laughs> it was, it was inadvertently because it really it came down to, okay, we want to build an organization mm -hmm. and we want that organization to build this platform, the platform mm -hmm. I'm describing. But we want it to be done by all these these intelligent, wise people out there that have their own organization. They have their own community. So how can we build an organization that includes these communities to build this out and, and discuss, you know, on a much larger, much larger scale, discuss governance and all those things? Um, how can we do that? Well, we need to govern that organization. And how do we govern that organization? Well, we could do it this way. We could do it the way Cardano is doing it. We could do it the way Singularity is doing it. But we've learned a bit from each of those experiences. And we've learned from doing the research what a sociocracy, same thing. And I, I think sociocracy is great, but it's similar to like what you're describing, neuro, like neurodivergent and neurotypical, they behave differently. Mm -hmm. So you can't expect sociocracy to fit and work for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't think it does. So if you can build, and that's sort of what we're doing with our organization is it supports this type of governance, this type of governance, this type of governance. And if we can bring those together and agree to live with each other, amongst each other and collaborate, then we can get somewhere. We can go mm -hmm. together. It doesn't have to be my way or the highway. It can be mm -hmm. support all these different ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what's exciting to me. That sounds fascinating. It's like um, building bridges for people to be able to kind of discuss things in the middle without necessarily having to conform ourselves uh, to the norm, uh, but rather build upon what our, our particular specialities are, um, neuro, neurology or otherwise. Yeah. Uh, you for oh, that for brother that. i'll hit you up on uh, linkedin yeah. yeah i'm doing it right now and maybe i'll send you um i've been working a little bit on the light now it needs it needs a lot of work it, <laughs> the light paper needs a lot of work i i am um amazed by how well you guys come together and put it into a vision would you say that that was it easier in your case's case to have one person sort of building the, the vision and putting that into a package or was that distributed hmm. within your group? This is interesting. It's a great question. Uh, for us, in our case, it was only the two of us, myself and uh, Johan or Quincy. Uh, Quincy took care of the business side of things. Um, of course, they have the uh, prototype carbon capture unit he had some articles on that that he provided, wrote, wrote some scripts. Uh, I took care of the metaverse side, how we'd handle environments and interaction and avatars and uh, wrote the proposal, those parts of the proposal as well. We succeeded in it. Um, for I, We did the same thing for this round three. For a round four proposal, I think it would be important for us to have someone who can articulate the computer science side of it as part of the proposal because we're a bit light on that currently but small team and clearly defined areas of our responsibility and we find we kind of bounce out that off of each other i'll say we need to do this you'll say we have time to do that that kind of thing yeah. thank you for that yeah you're welcome I'm, I'm, for my I'm own project i'm sorry my apology 
no. uh, for my own projects, like the um, the lowered world uh, knowledge graph. Um, I would go at that with more of kind of like a council discussion between us of the lower uh, between base blocks because base blocks will know how best to execute but we have the vision and um, my other fellows in the lower we're good at kind of counterbalancing each other in terms of is this an ambitious idea of marketing or is that too narrow a view of what we're going for and it seems to work so far so we'd have more of a round table i think in that situation okay yeah, because I'm, I'm like you said earlier this as well. I could talk all day about this topic, and I could talk all day about this topic, and then when somebody says, "Okay, we'll get it out on paper and put it in one page," <laughs> oh man, I, I don't know. One Where do page I start? is really <laughs> tough. Yeah, it's a long yeah. page, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> take out the the page the page breaks. breaks. <laughs> and, yeah, I got one page. <laughs> yeah, that the same with the light paper. It's it's going off. Where I need to consolidate it, and I think it's like fifteen pages right now. And That's pretty good. I work on it. Yeah. But, and that's only one. That's that's the organization um, light paper. We need the platform. We need mm -hmm. a specific light paper that discusses, okay, here's the plan. Because mm -hmm. um, the organization is about how we're going to operate and function as a decentralized organization. And it will be, mm -hmm. in our case, member-based member -based organization because it's kind of the only way we can um, leverage, or, well, it's it's uh, we see it as a value economy you know people are bringing their value in and as long as the relationship is benefiting all the parties so the participants mm -hmm. the contributors and the members are benefiting from this system and the system can benefit from their value contribution and we want it to be a, a sustainable type of economy where mm -hmm. the organizations never taking you know i think capitalism is about extracting value from all those people and trying to aggregate it you know in a central mm -hmm. entity and we're just trying to say like it, there's this organization but value flows in and out of it it's, mm -hmm. it's never being captured by mm -hmm. the organization directly um so forming a more abundant sustainable uh, ecosystem is what we're mainly after and just using governance as a form of tool to achieve that and to explain the inner relationships with all the, the members that sounds intensely valuable because if the income is flowing through group members uh, rather than being centralized then what will members do with that additional uh, security and that additional um material shall we say if we think of currency as material uh, I know during the pandemic, when we had temporary uh, income supplements, a lot of people developed their art skills or they started uh, entrepreneurial projects or they furthered their education. And so in your system where the resources can be distributed and flow through and among and in and out of the group itself, it seems that is a much more nutritious way to build something than to aggregate it out of their hands into um, a single uh, philosophy, uh, a single uh, um, handler. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. It's faith it's in people. Exciting. Yeah, and it'll be exciting to see. I mean, a lot of us, uh, for instance, me, I'm a part of a bunch of different organizations, communities, um, mm -hmm. decentralized communities, and and I participate where I can in all of them. But if you were to pin me down and ask me, okay, well, who do you represent? It's difficult, you know, other than Decipher, because that's a vision that, that I'm, I'm a primary actor in. Um, but besides that, you know, I, I, I don't, I see myself as all these other different things and where mm -hmm. I can add value. I see it all over the place mm -hmm. uh, so in this ecosystem where, okay, hey, there, yeah, sure, there's an organization where you maybe go and, and do activities but you like so you and i if we happen to be in a conversation and oh you know we could work on this independent thing mm -hmm. together and collaborate we can do that regardless of low it regardless of decipher mm -hmm. regardless of singularity net we can kind of go and do that mm -hmm. and bring that value to say decipher organization or singularity net 
and we're constructing this smart contract concept where can we, we built this thing or we did research and produced an artifact that's his research paper or a data set mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. an AI mm -hmm. and um, that gets used by somebody else. We'll just bring that smart contract into their thing, maybe their product, mm -hmm. then that product gets integrated into say a service, that service mm -hmm. ends up somebody's platform and all five of those entities are completely different organizations or collaborations but they're all getting accounted for right stacking the <laughs> stacking value you know mm -hmm. and it can be written on chain in smart contracts but that enables the individuals to act of their own free will versus the constraints of their organization right and and the organization can capture the culture, the vision and the purpose, and the individuals allowed to go and find where they're most valuable and contribute where they're most valuable. That's interesting to me. That's fascinating. It becomes a, a form of propulsion to move between projects, but still have presence and ownership through smart contracts in that part of the process. This also becomes a, a, a means of building up uh, one's own contribution, whether it's a scholarly or technological or participation in terms of being present, um, but having an, enough of a record of it, that it's all bona fide. Yeah. 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 And of course, it's one of those emergent things that you don't, you don't know what will come of it. You don't know what mm -hmm. will become or out the results, the outcome, but it's an interesting experiment for me. This is a time where we need the experiments. Yeah, yeah. So I hope to see you around and can't wait to see the results, you know, these, this voting and I hope Lilith gets moving in progress. This is exciting, exciting times. Thank you very, very much, Curtis. I appreciate it. And I'll look for you on LinkedIn as well. And I look forward to, to reading about the, the projects you're involved in. Thank you. It's great to meet you. You as well. Take care. Live long and prosper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ha, <laughs>